For thousands of years, civilization has been a destructive force, both ecologically and culturally. Deep in the abyss of the sixth extinction, the future of humanity and our other-than-human kin hangs by a thread. At this pivotal moment in time, we must reach back into the depths of the human story and uncover our mistakes. I invite you to go with me down the rabbit hole as I seek out the silenced, forgotten, buried, abandoned, and demonized stories and practices of regenerative, egalitarian, place-based cultures. There is still time to reconnect with what we have lost, to restore our broken relationships to the land where we dwell, and to remember the human place in the wild. Hello, and welcome to the Rewilding Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Michael Bauer. I'm coming to you from Portland, Oregon the traditional territory of the Multnomah and Clackamas Chinookan people, as well as the Kalapuya, Malala, Cowlitz, and many other tribal groups whom have lived here, subsisted here, and traveled here to trade and make their living since time immemorial. Today, uh, as of this moment, I am in my basement at my, the house that I rent. It is going to be 114 degrees or higher, theoretically, in Portland today, which will be the hottest temperature ever on record for this area. Uh, we are in the midst of a climate crisis, and this is, of course, caused by civilization and not humanity as a whole. The Hadzame, the Bushmen, the indigenous peoples all around the world did not create this crisis. This is a crisis fueled in part through agricultural states and there's a great book called Plows, Plagues, and Petroleum, How Humans Took Control of the Climate, which hypothesizes that the actual shift in global climate change began with humans all over the world enacting agricultural practices. Um, agriculture is one of those words that people tend to use as a synonym for cultivation or any kind of conscious management of landscapes. So when I say agriculture, what I want to make sure is that I'm talking about grain-based monocultures that have been exported from a floodplain where natural disturbances keep those annuals growing to areas that are no longer in a naturally disturbed area but are artificially disturbed through the process of tilling the soil and irrigation. Generally, this has to do with grain production, and in order to create these environments, we have to deforest large regions. Um, as well as the tilling of the soil, ends up losing a lot of the soil. So the carbon from the soil then goes into the ocean, causing ocean acidification, and also into the air through the tilling. And then we're cutting down trees that are and ripping up perennial grains and grasses that are pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. So we can go far enough back and notice climate shifts happening with the advent of this particular kind of subsistence strategy in mass. Humans have probably been enacting this kind of strategy all over in different areas, but it never really stuck until what people call the agricultural revolution, which wasn't really a revolution since people had already been practicing these things. What really it means is that this is when we see large communities enacting this as their sole subsistence strategy. And from there, an exponential growth of civilization and eventually the state are sort of the fruition of those things. Of course, with industrial revolution and um, the production of the steam engine and coal power and then oil power, we've seen the climate and the carbon being released at rates never before seen, even with the climate warming from early agricultural settlements all over the world. Um, so I thought I would take this moment of being trapped in my basement to to make a podcast where I answer my patron prompts. So for those who don't know, I created a Patreon to help fund this podcast. Uh, please, you can um, become a patron if you like for as little as a dollar a month. Anything helps, and you'll get access to the podcast two weeks before they go public. So it just gives a little incentive for folks who are eager to listen to the next thing um, to just you know, spend a little bit of money, a dollar a month or whatever. If, if you want to contribute more, obviously that would be great and I would be, appreciate it very much. Um, but 
what I'm doing for all of my patrons is any patron, anyone who becomes a patron, even at the dollar level, I will answer a patron prompt is what I'm calling it, which is essentially throw out a topic for me to talk about or a question for me to answer. And I'll spend a little bit of time on a podcast answering the question or talking about that subject from a rewilding perspective. Um, so yeah, I've got a few patrons that have asked me some questions and given me some prompts. So today I'm going to go down that rabbit hole and kind of explore some of these questions with you. Uh, some of them are pretty easy. Some of them are really challenging. I like that sort of diversity of being able to talk about different things for different lengths. So we'll see how long this goes. I'm just going to answer questions until I kind of run out of steam here, or we get to over an hour in the podcast or something along those lines. And we'll see how it goes. This is going to be my first one. So bear with me um, as we explore this. So the first question prompt is from Susan Avery, who asked me, what are your favorite wild edible or medicinal plants? And this is one of my favorite questions. It's, I say a softball question because it's easy for me to talk about what the things I like, right? It's not like a heady philosophical uh, worldview type thing I have to answer. So um, I really like my favorite wild food, hands down, is cattails. The cattail shoot in the spring, like late spring, early summer, before it starts to send up a stalk with a flower head on it. You can cut it off and throw it in a fire, kind of like corn on the cob, and you roast it, and then you peel away the outer leaves, and the inside is like this delicious, starchy vegetable, essentially. And I can't really describe how it tastes. It's just like, it's so rich. It, it tastes like almost fatty or something. You know, like it, it just, it tastes so filling and delicious and doesn't require anything else other than just like tossing it in the coals. The challenge with, of course, finding cattails that are clean enough to eat at this point in time in history when most of the marshlands are, you know, basically biohazards from all of the industrial chemicals that leach into the water system that's being filtered through those wetlands. Um, yeah, that's challenging. So there's a couple spots that I've found over the years up in the mountains or the foothills to the mountains um, that are large enough for me to gather just a handful a year. Um, so I'll camp out there and just gather just a few of them. And then I'll come back there in the fall and harvest the cattails for um, basketry materials too, the leaves as they're about to start dying off anyway. I'll go in and harvest those so that I have some weaving projects. So I've got like a relationship built with a particular cattail swamp. There's a couple smaller ones that I'll get some stuff from sometimes too. Um, unfortunately, when the fires came last year here in September, October, they burned through all those areas and now um, they're all closed to the public. There's actually a metal gate that has been installed to prevent civilians from going in there while they massively log the entire area. Um, for quote-unquote safety concerns, which I do recognize there are a lot of safety concerns with previous forest fire areas. Um, they will burn out root systems. You could be walking along through a burn and just fall into a hole from a previous or still burning root cavern. Um, so there are safety concerns, but of course the logging that's going to happen there is probably going to actually do more damage than the fire did itself because the fire was essentially a a cleansing process that was necessary um, to diversify the forests because those for those forests were essentially uh you know douglas fir tree farms that's how the government manages them and they call them forests but they're not really so fire can move through there douglas firs are are very flammable and the whole forest burned that's what is going to happen when you put all this flammable material close together in a in a enclosed space and you have climate change right so hopefully we'll see a lot of life rebounding there i went in and i looked at some of those burned out areas and they are rebounding i don't know what the long-term rebound will look like but um anyway yeah i'm hoping to have access to that cattail swamp again at some point in the future or find another one where i can harvest because they're just some of my most favorite plants. Um, another thing I could do theoretically is transplant some of them. I've we in the past, Rewild Portland has done a cattail harvesting class, and we gathered a whole bunch of the rhizomes from that swamp and gave them out to people to plant in swampy areas that they have, so that they know where they're coming from. We're regenerating uh, cattail marsh areas, and then also sort of tending those spaces on an individual basis to give them a better chance of surviving in the long run. 
um, being wild tended by people. So that's my favorite wild plant, cattail. Um, and my favorite medicinal plant is probably, I would go with stinging nettle. I also just love it as a, I love the flavor of stinging nettle just as a food, um, as a supplement. You know, well, I have, that's also another one that I transplant a lot of and grow in my backyard and stuff. So we have, you know, um, I'll, I'll dehydrate the leaves and then crush them up into like a powder and put them in a shaker, like oregano, basically, so that I have that kind of flavor I can, I can add to things throughout the whole year, even though, um, you know, nettles, you don't really want to start eating. You don't want to eat the leaves later in the year. You want to get them early in the spring because by, by later in the season, um, they're supposedly full of too much silica or something, and that can be bad for you. I also eat the ones in the fall. So sometimes if we cut them late in the fall for fiber, they sometimes will send up like a secondary crop. Uh, in fact, my nettles actually didn't even die until like late December last year. They flowered twice because it was so warm. So it'll be interesting to see how nettles change and <laughs> what happens to them over this this warming climate as well. Um, but medicinally, medicine as a medicine, uh, nettles are great for allergies. And a lot of people know the Willamette Valley is the grass seed capital of the United States or maybe the world. I don't know. Um, so there's a lot of pollen here and a lot of allergies, a lot of seasonal allergies in the spring and, and summer. So what's nice is at the same time that the pollen is starting to generate, the stinging nettle is coming up from the ground. And so if you have a lot of that tea, the tea is an antihistamine. So it can help you um, in that season, the season that we need it. And it's also just tasty. Um, it does make you pee a lot, though, so be ready to go to the bathroom. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's that's my favorite wild and medicinal plants right there. Boom. Got that one out of the way. All right, now for a more challenging question. Nikki Youngsma asked me, what are criticisms of the megafauna overkill hypothesis and or competing and or complementary theories for megafauna extinction? What are ways we can use this information to inform present and future living? How can such information and framing support healthier relationship with land and non-human kin that affirms human existence rather than instills shame? So a lot, a lot to unpack in there. I recently had a Facebook post where I went through a lot of this stuff because I too have some of these similar kinds of questions. There's this idea of humans being sort of innately flawed that a lot of people in civilization cling to. And therefore, it's just in our nature to destroy ourselves, right? Like that's, that's what Arnold Schwarzenegger's character, The Terminator, says in Terminator 2, right? It's in your nature to destroy yourselves. That line, I remember sitting as a teenager, hearing that and being like, I don't have, I don't want to destroy myself. So therefore, it can't be human nature because I have the feeling of wanting to be here. And I actually, that, that, that movie and that question is what propelled me into rewilding because I was having this conversation with a friend and I was like, I don't think it's in our nature to destroy ourselves. You know, like the, the Terminator says or whatever. She was like, I just finished reading this book called Ishmael. You should read it. It's all about this kind of stuff. Um, and I did. And of course, that was Daniel Quinn's book, which is sort of about uh, the theory of the rise of civilization and our myth, our cultural mythologies, one being that humans are innately flawed. So oftentimes, I think there's this idea when we research the past, we're researching it through a lens or we, I'm particularly civilization and the scientists of civilization are researching it through a lens of humans already being flawed. So they find evidence that supports this idea or they don't look into how it gets analyzed. So when we look at data that looks like humans potentially cause the megafauna extinctions, it reflects this mythology of us being inherently flawed. And there isn't a lot of ideas around um, sort of shifting the blame away from humans for the megafauna extinctions. For those who don't know, the megafauna extinctions, um, you know, coincide all over the planet with Homo sapiens migrations out of Africa. So we see a huge, um, you know, just a huge shift. And the, the challenge here is that correlation does not necessarily mean causation. So just because humans were moving into those regions doesn't mean that at the same time that the megafauna were dying doesn't necessarily mean that we were the cause of their death. It could be that humans were moving into those areas because the megafauna were opening up ecosystems. Their, their deaths were opening up ecosystems that previously we didn't have access to because they were there. But 
I think for me, there's the inversion of that idea of if humans are not inherently flawed, then maybe we're the inversion of that. Maybe we have some sort of innate ability to quote unquote steward a place. So oftentimes I think in our society, it's such a fundamentalist society that we swing from one extreme to the other. And it's important for us to sort of have a more neutral perspective, I think, in looking at ecosystems and evolution so that we don't uh, have extreme views that end up shifting our thinking in a way that doesn't work for whatever it is that we're trying to do, whether that be survive in the long run or just survive another day. So in that sense, I want to kind of explore this idea of feeling shame. Why would we have to feel shame if indeed humans did overhunt the megafauna? What, what is shameful about that? And if we recognize that humans are actually just like any other animal and we don't actually have um, a level of intelligence of being able to weigh our actions on the environment until it's already happened and maybe then see it in retrospect, what if they were our fault? And I kind of want to start from that position. What if humans really did exterminate the megafauna? What then? What does that say about us? It does not necessarily have to go in this direction of us being innately flawed. We can take it in another direction, which is that we are neutral, just like any other animal would want to uh, consume the things in its environment to subsist on, only we have something else that these other animals don't have, and that is our intellect, our hands. And with those two things, we were able to create technology. And technology is one of the things that really separates humans from other animals. And that's not to say technology, like just making things. Obviously, like other animals make nests. Some animals use sticks as tools. So it's not just these kind of random things, but it's this ability. I think what um, Louis Liebenberg in his book, the art of tracking the origin of science calls hypodeductive reasoning. Um, the ability to create a theory and take action on it. So in animal tracking, um, you know, you could follow a set of footprints and follow them all day and never reach that animal. But what trackers do is they follow a set of footprints to the point where they know what the animal's thinking and they can deduce its next moves and then arrive in that place where it's going or you know, where it thinks it wants to go prior to it getting there. Being able to jump from one place to the next without having to go all the way around and following those tracks is what allowed humans to sort of, um, in one, in, in Louis Liebenberg's theory anyway, the idea of animal tracking being one of the, the main components of our evolution in terms of developing high, hypodeductive reasoning. And in doing so, um, it gives us the ability to plan in a way that other species don't have. And that planning allows us to kind of create steps ahead um, and figure out things. And with that knowledge and that kind of thinking, we're able to create all kinds of technology that opens up food resources in an environment that were not open to us before. And if we think of humans as just like any other animal, not stupid, not more intelligent, based on you know whatever whatever intelligence means but just like any other kind of animal then any other kind of animal when given a, a tool that would adapt them to access more food in an environment they would access that food and you would see environmental repercussions across ecosystems and i believe that is what has happened with humans in general i think that we have an ability to alter landscapes because of our hypodeductive reasoning that has been detrimental to species across the world as we've migrated to those places. That doesn't mean that we're inherently evil. It doesn't mean that we're inherently destructive. It just means that we're like any other animal, and but we've been given a massive tool for quote-unquote adaptation. And what that tool does is gives us the ability to access calories stored in our land base that we didn't have access to before. And each time we come up with a new idea to get more calories, our populations grow. And what that means is that other populations decline, right? Because one population can't grow unless it's consuming another population. 
And so what we have now is, you know, hunter gatherer societies all over the world that have probably collapsed on micro scales over many, many thousands of years, as well as more sedentary cultures that have obviously collapsed. But the thing about collapse is I highly recommend Joseph Tainter's book, The Collapse of Complex Societies. And while that focus, the book of the, the while the focus of that book is complex societies, which essentially just means like civilization, large scale, sedentary people, um, more quote unquote simple societies that are more nomadic in general or just in a smaller scale, they can collapse too. And what it has to do is diminishing returns. So anytime a and, and this we can see this with just population growth in different species. When you have a predator and prey relationship, if the prey have a large population, the predator's population is going to grow to match that, and then it's going to decline. So it looks like a waveform, right, where you have population growing, population declining, and those coexist between predator and prey. It's not, um, you know, some people think of it as a balance, but the reality is it's always sort of chaotic. You could think of it as a balance, but it's really just a wave that goes up and down, sometimes higher, sometimes lower, and sometimes it crashes completely. So there really isn't anything like a static or or even homeostasis within ecosystems. They're in constant flux. However, that constant flux, that constant cycle of regeneration and disturbance that happens between species can be um, a smaller wave or it can be a bigger wave depending on the level of disturbance. So every time an animal evolves a new way, you know, biologically to access food, usually it has to do with environmental pressures, right? Like um, climate change or some sort of disaster might shift the ecosystem in a particular way that causes stress, that causes pressure, and a creature will start eating something else, basically, right? And then they'll evolve more efficiently to eat that other thing as the waves of disturbance decrease in scale. So what happens with humans is that instead of evolving biologically due to environmental pressures, because we have hypodeductive reasoning and we're just like any other animal, that pressure has allowed us to think up of ways of accessing different food that we had no access to before. And a large portion of that is fire and stone tools, the most basic things that made us human. Stone tools are the things that you know allowed us to crack open giant bones of the megafauna in order to get the marrow and the animal fat inside of it that had been theoretically killed by other predators, bigger megafauna than we are, uh, that just didn't have access to those bones. But we created stone tools. And then for a million years, that's really all we see in terms of human technology uh, starting, well, even, you know, depends on when, when we're looking at the first stone tool industry. So now they think the first stone tool industry is 3.3 million years ago in Africa. But the the classic oldest one is the Oldowan industry that started 2.5 million years ago. And the Oldowan industry looks the same. All of the stone tools basically look the, sta- the same for a million years. And then you get into the Acheulean hand axe, which is a, a sort of an innovation, a level up in stone tool technology that then goes on for another almost million years before we really reach the upper Paleolithic, which is like 60, 70,000 years ago, when we start to see a way more... Uh, a, a way, a very different transition in terms of technology. Um, a lot of innovating, a lot of adaptation and diversifying of technology that was not seen in the millions of years previous. And that coincides with the megafauna extinctions. So there's an interesting kind of th- way of thinking about this that perhaps, um, you know, I, f- I just want to jump back a little bit too, that fire gave us the ability to cook our food and That made it more energy efficient. We could get more nutrients faster. Our digestion didn't have to take as long. Our intestines shrank because of that. Uh, And our jaws got, quote unquote, weaker or just not as strong as they had been because we weren't chewing all the time anymore. So we weren't having to do that. Um, So this is all to say that, you know, humans have been adapting and changing for a long time, but something did change in us that... Uh, cause this upper paleolithic transition into more diversity of tool production. Um, you know, we start to see all kinds of things relatively recently. And, you know, a lot of this stuff could have existed in different parts of the world in different times. But the challenge is 
we don't have a lot of stuff in the archaeological record, right? There aren't tons of finds that are super, super old in terms of perishable material culture. So like there's no such thing as a bone age, but that's just because bones decompose. The reason we call it the Stone Age is because stone is the only thing that persists that long because it's a geological, it's a rock, right? They don't decompose. Um, but fiber, wood, plants, bones, all of those things, hides, skin, you know, the, all of those things decompose. So we don't know all of the facts around when people started using those things. But we can see that within 100 to 90,000, 70,000 years ago, we start to understand that these are when these things evolved. Um, examples, even in like skeletal structure, for example, with shoes, we know that shoes are probably like 40,000 years old, not because we have found footwear, the oldest footwear uh, in the world is actually a cave here in Oregon. Um, they found sandals woven out of grass and they're 12,000 years old. But the oldest evidence of footwear is actually like 40,000 years because of human skeletons. And we can look at skeletons in the feet and see that the feet were feet that were grown from childhood into adulthood in a confined space, right? And they stayed in a particular shape and you don't really see the shape of a, of a foot that particular way unless it's grown up living with shoes so we know for example that the shoes were forty thousand years old not all over the world but in particular place right the same is true of clothes we don't have you know leather that goes back that far however the body louse the human body louse that can only exist with clothes is about a hundred thousand years old through fossil records so we can hypothesize that human clothing is only about 100,000 years old in terms of, you know, when the louse evolved. It could be older than that, right? Because it could have taken time for the louse to evolve to, in, to be in that environment. So we don't know the, the full breadth of that, but that's like a good marker for it. And it's like this across the board with all the kinds of technology. But really what we see is, is these more, um, more and more technology being created over the last like 50 to 100,000 years and um, that's not to say that there was some sort of inevitability of any of this stuff, but rather social pressures, environmental pressures, biological pressures on a, just an animal with the ability to alter its landscape and environment. That, it, you know, <laughs> so in that sense, it's just not, um, I don't really like to place blame on humans. I don't think humans are innately flawed. I think we are just another animal. And I think that the majority of traditional ecological knowledge that exists today, particularly in indigenous societies, is something learned, not something innate in people. I, I think that micro collapses of overexploitation of environments gave people the understanding of what they were doing, and they came up with cultural limitations to growth. That is kind of like the clincher here is the cultural limitations to growth. Because humans figured out essentially how to hack, I hate that word, but, you know, hack into all of the calories in a given environment and consume them for themselves. And those calories are living beings. And without any environmental limit to growth, we did grow. Eventually, on a micro scale, those environments collapse, people realize their mistake, and they figure out ways of equalizing it. How this plays into the origins of agriculture is a whole other can of worms that I would love to talk about at some point. But right now we're just talking about the megafauna extinctions, right? So I'm going to go back because I've been ranting about this for a while. I'm actually going to go back and reread Nikki's question. What are the criticisms of the megafauna overkill hypothesis and or competing and or complementary theories for megafaunal extinction? The criticisms over the megafauna overkill hypothesis is that we don't actually have a lot of evidence of specifically human predation on these animals so for example while we have lots of mammoth bones with um knife marks or you know scoring marks on it that would imply they were processed by humans using stone tools that had hunted them we don't have a lot of other evidence of um a lot of the megafauna that did go extinct we don't have a lot of evidence of them being processed by humans so that's one of the challenges to the theory is like well where's your evidence that they were actually killing them to eat them the uh, the kind of flip side to that is that maybe we our impacts on the environment could have killed the megafauna without them being overhunted. For example, humans 
uh, you know, with the advent of fire, the ability to control fire, immediately we're given um, probably one of the most powerful tools of nature to disturb an environment. And we did so. We used fire excessively. Uh, potentially, you know, I mean, there's no, I think the oldest hearth, the oldest theoretical hearth is 400,000 years old, but there's a lot of theories and some minor evidence that project the human continuous use of fire into Homo erectus, which would mean a million years. Um, but we know that humans were using fire at about 400,000 years ago. That's kind of like the accepted, uh, whatever, accepted belief within archaeology based on evidence, 400,000 years of having hearths, meaning we were controlling fire. It doesn't necessarily mean we were making it, but that we had the ability to um, gather it in a forest fire or something and maintain it. That said, um, the idea that humans were altering landscapes with fire means that all of the plants and animals that existed in those environments could have been killed or you know we could have caused the mass the, the megafaun extinction simply because of a cascade effect of our ability to maintain and manipulate landscapes with fire and whatever we were doing in that sense could have had uh effects on all the other species there and there's an interesting thing where you know the the archaeological evidence points to humans not going after like the sick and the slow mammoths but rather the largest and the fattiest mammoths out there. So, um, you know, we have this idea of like, oh, well, we, you know, predators and hunters, you know, we should only take the sick and the weak and um, thin the herd and that kind of thing. But that's not, that's not what the archaeological evidence shows that humans were doing. It looks like from, from what we can see that humans were taking giant animals um, to subsist on. So I think, again, there's this, technological advantage that we have over biological advantage so in terms of like say a wolf population and a deer population a predator is going to take the um you know they're gonna, they're going to want to expend the least amount of energy possible to get fed so they're going to go after the slowest and that's just going to happen because of biology but it, what would happen if you gave those wolves the ability all of a sudden to be faster really really fast and they could go after the biggest ones and they could get them down and that's kind of what we see with technology right is this this thing that happens where all of a sudden we don't have to just get the slowest ones we don't have to just get the weakest ones we have this huge advantage with technology and one of those things that people talk about uh you know in terms of the the overkill hypothesis was one of the reasons it started was this idea of chasing mammoths off of cliffs uh, entire herds of bison and mammoths and different things were hypoth uh, you know, hypothetically chased off of cliffs all at once. And the idea of like, well, humans are stupid and wasteful. However, now more recently, what they've seen, at least for Neanderthals, is that these mammoth cliff jump sites, humans would specifically corral one or two mammoths from the herd and chase the one off the cliff. But you do that for thousands and thousands of years, and what you're left with is a, a mammoth graveyard. And so when people were looking at these, they were thinking that they had run entire mammoths off of the cliff. But really now, because of better dating techniques, they've figured out that these mammoth sites were used for thousands of years. So it wasn't just, let's chase a whole group of mammoths off a cliff. It was, let's select one, get it off the cliff over and over and over and over and over again for thousands of years. So you're left with this thing that looks like potentially, oh my God, they killed all the mammoths all at once. But really what it was was, um, they were occupying that site for thousands of years, doing this over and over again to get fed. So that's, again, one of those things that like, well, they weren't totally stupid, right? They weren't running entire mammoths off of cliffs. So <laughs> we're not a dumb animal. We're not an evil animal, but we're also not necessarily like the most uh, in tune with the kind of larger scale effects that we might have created with our pyro culture, essentially, right? Because once humans had... Um, the use of fire, we were altering the landscapes everywhere. And that could have had a cascade effect on the megafauna, on everything. And it did, because we, we see that now there are many, many species that are fire, quote unquote, fire adapted, and many that actually only can germinate, like plants, like pine cones that can only germinate after a fire. A fire cracks open their cones, and then they can grow into a tree. The seed will germinate after a fire. So there's a lot of species like this that are, are well adapted to fire, and that's largely because of 
the regular burnings that humans started when we took control of fire. Uh, so it's just something to consider in terms of the larger scale of thinking about humans over time and that we're not geniuses, but we're also not inherently flawed. We're just animals. And I think it just keep we have to just come back to that. We're just animals. And we learn and you know, but because we have hypodeductive reasoning, we can learn from our mistakes. So once we have these micro collapses, we can come up with cultural limitations to growth because we no longer have environmental ones. Our intellect and our hands, our ability to manipulate the environment gave us an ultimate advantage over everything. And so what we've had to do in, in place of, <laughs> of that is come up with cultural limitations. And so when I think about uh, particularly First Nations in the, here in the North America, um, when I think about their traditional ecological knowledge, I think these are people who figured this out because of their interactions with the environments. So the idea of you know thinking seven generations into the future, for example, comes from people who are so connected to the environment that they can see their impacts. And they've probably made impacts that they learned from in the past, potentially micro collapses of sorts of small scale societies, as well as large scale societies. Um, and that doesn't necessarily say that uh, the cultural limitations to growth, the narratives and mythology and quote unquote religions and beliefs and practices and customs that we generate are going to always stay in that, in that same way, right? Like the same mistakes could be made again in the future. People are forgetful. We're just animals. So we can forget those lessons and then have to learn them again in the future. The problem is at this point, um, you know, in, in North America, there were a lot of culture and all over the world. Indigenous people were constantly figuring this out because of the scale of their society. Their scale was minimized or, or small enough that they could learn from these mistakes and come up with cultural limitations to growth. The challenge is with agricultural states, um, the hierarchies are are so embedded in their society that it's impossible to change. And, it, and it's such a rigid structure that grows so fast. We are now in the midst of a sixth extinction and a climate crisis. Whereas if we had not, you know, had a colonial agricultural society, uh, we would not have gotten to the point that we're at today. And it's just kind of sad to see because I think people were learning this lesson. I think agriculture itself, conscious, uh, you know, even pyroculture, what all the things, uh, every time we have a new technology, a new idea, it's like a Pandora's box that then we have to figure out how to exist within. Otherwise, you know, we'll, we don't necessarily have to figure it out. Evolution will figure it out for us, right? Um, but we can figure it out as hypodeductive reasoning animals. It just, uh, it depends on a lot of other circumstances because we are at the end of the day, just animals. Um, so the second question is what are ways we can use this information to inform present and future living? Well, I think this, this sums it up is there are indigenous cultures all around the world right now who've been living in these, uh, regenerative and destructive cycles for so long that they've figured it out. And that's why 80% of the world's biodiversity still exists on their lands because they figured out how to not um, continuously disrupt that biodiversity. And so, how, you know, this information should inform us to first and foremost protect indigenous societies wherever they exist today, collaborate with indigenous societies, reinvigorate indigenous societies, and diminish agricultural colonial subsistence as much as we can to transition to something else while we have time to make those transitions possible, or at least, at the very least, plant the seeds for that transition as civilizations across the planet and the network of civilizations decline and disintegrate. And all of this is, you know, rewilding is inevitable. So really what we're doing is how do we use this information to inform the transition to a different life way and hope that, you know, if, if we do have a stake in humanity surviving, <laughs> hope that these things that we're doing now will make a difference in terms of planting back. And at the end of the day, they may not make a difference for humans. They may not make a difference for the things that exist on the planet now. But one of the things that we have to think about too is just how a life in general, if you're feeling shame or guilt, um, think about it this way. You know, um, there was an algal bloom millions and millions of years ago that basically killed everything in the water, every, almost every living thing. But that algal bloom created the oxygen that we believe that we breathe in today. 
And so if it weren't for this mass extinction that happened millions and millions of years ago, we would not be here because it created the environment that led to the evolution of humans. And that's just how life works. Life proliferates and life spreads. There's no way to kill life. So whatever is alive in a million years and thriving will be alive because of the conditions that civilization created. So, you know, if you fast forward millions of years in the future and you're talking to the beings that are alive that are stoked to have their their turn at, at living, they're going to be like, oh, yeah, that the collapse of, you know, the ecosystem was great because it gave way to the creation of us. Right. Um, and while we as humans are emotional creatures and we're destroying our environments and it's really stressful and horrible and we're seeing our friends and kin and other than human kin being killed by our own hands um, because we are just animals and it's sad. At the same time, you can look in that sort of long, you, you can feel that sadness and grief because we should of what's happening around us. And at the same time, recognize that life goes on and that life will proliferate and that life will have, um, will the things that exist will be in existence because of the changes that happened that we, that we were responsible for in part. I think the other thing, the other sort of side part of this question is humans ourselves, we, we can't, we like to say, uh, think of ourselves as like an individual kind of animal, but we are our environment. The environment created us. All of our interactions with other creatures, uh, plants, animals, elements, that made us. So we are all connected to those things that created us. And therefore, all of those things are also responsible for the situation that we're in because life is just adaptation and transformation. And so in that sense, if we extend our sort of consciousness out or our ability to see ourselves as more than human, but blur the lines between our physical bodies and our environments and see that we're actually one and the same, then it's a weird thing to sort of recognize that it's not our fault, quote unquote, but it's rather the whole ecosystem generated the situation that we're in. As hypodeductive reasoning animals, we think we have the ability to alter these things and to change them. And that may not be true. It may be true. And maybe we can, and we can on a, maybe on a micro scale, maybe on a macro scale, and we should try to do those things while we exist. Um, but to me, that eliminates the shame from this, this concept. I just think we're just animals and we're doing the best we can. And now that we know the a level of destruction that we are capable of, we can also recognize that we have an inversion of that. We can also use that hypodeductive reasoning to create more biodiversity, to minimize our growth, to create cultural limitations of human growth. And this gets into another thing which um, comes goes along with sort of the, the human population, uh, the challenges of the human population being what it is. And I don't like to use the word population growth or overpopulation because those are oftentimes tied to um, nowadays like white supremacy and eco-fascism. But the reality is that we've converted living things into like, you know, biomass, living biomass into human mass. And that is because of a cultural system that we have in place based on growth. And it's also just a biological response to the ability of any animal to access more calories in its landscape. But there are checks and balances in those ecosystems that humans, quote unquote, hacked, right? We've hacked all of the checks and balances of population. And in doing so, basically create a, a cultural phenomenon of human supremacy, where we're not really concerned about the population of other human, other than human species. And so there's an interesting way of re, reframing population to, rather than overpopulation, to reproductive justice. And there's a great book called Making Kin, Not Population. It's a, a collection of five essays by feminists around the idea of overpopulation. And I think my favorite part of the book was just framing it around the idea of reproductive justice, not just for humans, but for other than humans. What about the other than human reproductive justice of all the wild things that exist in the world? What about, you know, do we just, is it okay to just consume all of those things so that we can continue to exist and grow in our own population? What are the cultural limits that we could put in place? And not like uh, sort of the state, I'm not talking about state laws, cultural limits, like, re, re, um, you know, putting restrictions on the number of children people can proliferate. I'm talking about uh, 
cultural values that prevent people on a on a individual basis but through a cultural projection of beliefs and values that would make people inherently want to limit their growth that is a whole other conversation as well i don't and i kind of started to go down that rabbit hole but i i want to actually do a, a whole podcast on population um and and probably interview some of the authors from that book making kin not population but um i hope that kind of gets gets to the heart of that question of like maybe you know maybe the 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 question of the overkill hypothesis isn't did humans or did they not but rather does that matter and if not or if so why what are the underpinnings of why it would matter and if we see ourselves as just animals doing the best we can with the ability to alter our landscapes and hypodeductive reasoning we can change and we can understand and learn from our mistakes and we have and there's living examples of this and those <laughs> living examples are the ones that we need to uplift now and, and as fast as possible um, especially as collapse intensifies and as states begin to you know um, fight over the remaining resources that exist in order to stay alive um, and keep states functioning so um yeah all right there's that Oh, let's see here. I'm going to take a look at the next question. Next question is, do you know something about prehistoric childbirth and death rate? From Ilsa Donker. Um, I'm, what I'm guessing this question is about is, again, this kind of relates back a little bit to the population growth questions, but do I know something about prehistoric childbirth and death rate? I do know something about that, <laughs> but here's the, here's the little asterisk. All I know is what is, has been repeated over and over and over again. And this question actually makes me um, start to doubt and question even some of the fundamental ideas that we have about childbirth and death rate in prehistory. And I just want to preface this with, there was an author who came through Portland years ago who asked the audience, whose tribal lands are you occupying? Like, what, what is the name of the indigenous people whose lands Portland is, sits on? And back then, most people, I don't think they were conscious. This is a, lot, a long time ago when I was in my early 20s. And there was this myth here growing up that people didn't live no native people lived in what is now Portland, Oregon, because they believed that uh, this was the valley of sickness and death, and that the word Willamette for the Willamette River that runs through Portland meant, in some native language, the the valley of sickness and death. And of course, that was total bullshit, but this was essentially what most Portlanders believed. And when the author asked that question, and people answered with that answer, there was this little red <laughs> flag going off, you know, an alarm going off in the back of my head, like, that's bullshit. Why do I believe that? And where does that information come from? And reading this question from Ilsa, do you know something about prehistoric childbirth and death rate? I'm getting that same kind of thing. And it's because the projections of how people lived in the past are ba based on, you know, mathematical equations and some minimal archaeological evidence. Let's just say, for example, that the standard narrative is that children in prehistory died more regularly, or what's called infant mortality rates. The infant mortality rates of prehistoric, quote-unquote, prehistoric people are higher than agricultural or settled people. Uh, this has done a couple of things. The, the main issue that this causes is that people think then that um, humans in prehistory only lived, or you know, uh, people living hunter-gatherer lives only lived to the age of 35. And so there's this mythology there because the average lifespan is taking all of, the, all of them added up together and finding the middle or whatever, right? So you have people who live into their 70s, and you have a lot of people, and then you have a lot of people who die before the age of two. And when you range out the average of that, it ends up being like 35 years old. Even though if you live past the first two years of your life, you would live to be like 65 or 70. 
And so what people think is that the lifespan of most people in prehistory was only like 35 years. So you hear this myth all the time. Well, you know, people only live to be 35, so we have a way better now. Ha ha ha. And <laughs> and the reality is that is just not true. Um, there's a really great study that was done among contemporary hunter-gatherers that mirrors a lot of the theory around um, how people existed in prehistory. And we find that if you live past the age of two, your likelihood of survival um, to the age of like 65 is very high. So most people were living into to what we consider old age now today um, in prehistory. It's just that they had theoretically higher infant mortality rates. And because I've never actually... Um, and so this question is making me actually question the archaeology uh, around this idea of infant mortality rates being higher in prehistoric so societies. And I would really like to see a reassessment of how that theory came about and what the math is behind it. Because it seems pretty ludicrous to me um, for a lot of reasons. But uh, who knows? Maybe, again, and maybe that's normal. And, and especially if we look at the infant mortality rates among early agricultural settlements, you know, it, I, w I would imagine it would be relatively the same. I mean, even just looking like in my ancestry.com, my mom was obsessed with that for a long time. And just looking at the, the number of babies and that died in, you know, just even a couple hundred years ago was really high. So I don't know that I don't know a lot about it. What I know is the mythology and narratives around it, but I don't know where the science is coming from. And I haven't actually gotten in to see if there's been many criticisms of that science. So that would be a really cool exploration that is now on my list of things to do is really kind of get to the bottom of where that myth comes from. And it really makes me think, too, about even just, you know, an exa another example of this kind of thing of like everybody just sort of assumes this thing is real until somebody goes way back, looks at the data and then figures out how it might have been flawed. Um, but this happens a lot with edible plants. You know, somebody will make an edible plant book, eat a plant and then write about how it tastes terrible. And John Callis, who's a edible wild foods expert here in Portland, he talks about this in his classes where, you know, he'll taste a plant that in all the field guides, it says it tastes terrible. And he's like, this is actually really good. You know, um, but all of these books say it's terrible because this one person a hundred years ago wrote a book that said it was terrible, and all of these other books that have been published since have essentially just copied that. And this kind of thing happens all the time, and it happens particularly, I think, when uh, we want to believe the thing, or when we're just kind of lazy about it. We don't want to have to do the work ourselves. And so, you know, this oh, everybody in prehistory they didn't live past the age of thirty, thirty-five, so our lives are way longer and better now that kind of thing backs up this idea that civilization is awesome, that we actually have better lives now. But just go back into the Industrial Revolution, and prior to that, people were actually only living to 35 years old in agricultural communities. So, you know, all through the quote-unquote Dark Ages, like the lifespan was very short in comparison to what humans would have been in prehistory and what contemporary hunter-gatherers are today and what quote-unquote first world countries that have, uh, you know, medical infrastructures that can fight all of the diseases that have been caused by civilization to begin with can now exist on a uh, normal longevity of a lifespan, but only because of all of the medical quote unquote advancements to deal with all of the injuries and illnesses caused by civilization itself for the most part. Um, so yeah, that's my, do I know anything about prehistoric childbirth and death rate? Yeah, I know the basic narrative i don't know if it's true and i have a i i have doubts of it of its truthness but again it kind of comes back to this idea of the megafauna question of like are humans at fault um you know if if supposing that humans did have higher infant mortality rates in prehistory what so what um <laughs> again is that does does that mean, does that preclude us to kill everything living so that we can feed more babies because we had maybe natural limitations to our growth in the past that limited our ability to consume more things in an environment? Is having more children and more babies surviving um, that important that we have to kill other living things to feed more babies? I mean, this is a, a, just a question I have. It's not an answerable one, but just the idea of, does, how does the, the concept of human supremacy apply to this idea of our lives being better now because there's uh, 
less babies dying. And I think that that, that like, nobody wants babies to die, right? That's absurd to think about it that way. But in a culture where that's normal or regular, there would be emotional processing available to deal with that kind of grief on a regular basis in the same way that, you know, soldiers dying in war is something that we're accustomed to. Infants dying before the age of two would theoretically be something that cultures had been accustomed to and had a process for dealing with that kind of trauma. I mean, I know there there's a, an example I've heard in the past is that some societies don't give their children names until they reach two years and they have like a naming ceremony. And I wonder how much that has to do with this attachment and this kind of thing of like, what are the processes of handling um, an existence where this is probable and this is accepted as okay because it's uh, just part of existence, right? It's part of life is that not everything gets the opportunity to live. Um, and if we excel at giving more humans the opportunity to live, that means that other living things that we consume are losing their opportunity to live. And this is where we get around this idea of reproductive justice for other than humans. Once again, kind of comes back to that. Who decides, you know, who gets to live and die? That is like eco-fascism. That is states. That is, uh, you know, uh, that is not something that I would ever advocate for. I don't advocate for population control. I don't think about that kind of thing except on an individual basis in the same way that abortion should be an individual's decision or a family's decision. You know, do they, do they have the ability to support that? Um, you know, who wants it? It should be a person's choice. And in that sense, there should be cultural values in the same way that give, there's cultural values that allow people access to things like abortion. There should be access and a value that says, do we need more humans? Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. And I don't think that that should ever be a question answered by a state or an authority. That should be something that is intrinsic to a society's belief systems and customs. Uh, so yeah, and, and I'm not you know, sold on any particular idea other than being an anti-fascist and an anti-authoritarian and an anti-hierarchy anti myself. Um, so as long as genocide and those things are not being promoted, what are the, what are the ways people in their own scale, on their own small scale societies, want to work together to think up strategies for limiting the growth of humans and the growth of our consumption? Because really that's what it comes down to. You can't have more humans without more consumption. And so how do we limit our consumption? Um, could be another way of framing that. How do we limit our consumption for the reproductive justice of other than humans and humans that exist today? All right. So there's that one. And there's one more I want to talk about. This is uh, from Jermaine Tucker. This is a great one. Jermaine writes, one method of rewilding includes reintroducing apex predators and other key species back into the area. Presently, wolves have returned back to Oregon and Washington. What other key species can you think of reintroducing? They have already attempted to reintroduce the sea otter to the Oregon coast, but no success. Is it possible that the environment can no longer sustain the indigenous species that once inhabited the area? Amazing question. So, um, you know, this one relates obviously to more, I think, conservation rewilding, but without sort of the, the deeper understanding of human rewilding, this is where conservation rewilding falls short and is kind of absurd when you come to think of it. Reintroduction should not be um, a euphemism or a, not a euphemism, a synonym for rewilding. Reintroduction, it could be a, a strategy for rewilding, but oftentimes you see people using that interchangeably. Reintroduction is just one strategy in terms of rewilding an area, and it's worked great in certain places such as reintroducing wolves, um, not just here, but like, you know, Chernobyl's exclusion zone is a great example of reintroduction of species that has had huge success because <laughs> civilization can't access that area because it's irradiated. 
Um, but there's a great book called Wormwood, A Natural History of Chernobyl. It's a bit old now, but it talks about this. Also, the documentary Radioactive Wolves uh, is about Chernobyl and the, the exclusion zone and the, the animals that are thriving in that new environment. Um, so this question, what other key species can you think of reintroducing? This is cool, too, because, um, you know, I mean, the megafauna here went extinct, like mammoth, mammoths, for example, went extinct like 5,000 years ago. But there are people who think we should introduce elephants and savanna lions into North America as sort of replacements for mammoths and saber-toothed tigers. This is kind of fascinating to me because people think of ecosystems as, you know, when we, oh, we have to restore an ecosystem. And they're thinking about what it was at contact with colonial society, maybe like 100, 200, 300 years ago, 400 or 500. But the reality is, you know, human people have been here altering the landscape for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. There's no such thing as any kind of stable ecosystem to return a thing to. So, you know, Hazel the permaculture teacher who lives uh, down in Southern Oregon, Siskiyou Permaculture, they have this great question, restoration to what? And this relates across the board to all rewilding. Restoration to what? To a certain time? To a certain assemblage of species? <laughs> what is the thing that we are restoring and why? And will it actually stay in that thing if nature is complex and dynamic and ever-changing? Restoration to what? And really, it's not about restoring to a particular landscape, but rather the restoration of the relationship to place, of reciprocity, of regeneration, of minimizing our consumption, our impacts of disturbance, and maximizing the impact of regeneration. It's a return to a relationship, not to a particular moment in time and place. Um, this is why it's not, you know, rewilding is not about going back to who we were it's about coming home to who we are. And who we are is a species that has the ability to greatly alter our landscapes and has done so in many places all over time. And if we can understand how that happens, we can then minimize the consumption and disturbance and maximize the regeneration. So for me, you know, what other species can we think of reintroducing? I mean, I have no idea. I'm not a biologist in that sense, and I'm not a conservation biologist. So to me, it's not about necessarily reintroducing species but returning to a relationship. And maybe we do return species. Maybe they do, maybe people do let elephants and, you know, savanna lions loose in North America to quote unquote replace or restore, you know, restore. But you can never, you know, it's like a pet cemetery. You can bring them back, but they're never going to be the same, right? <laughs> so, you know, we might restore an area, but there are many different species now, invasive in particular, who want and can thrive in disturbed soils. So a, uh, an area that's been destroyed by civilization or habitat that's been altered by civilization, there are species that dog the tails of those of the particular disturbance that civilization causes. And we call those species invasive. But what was invasive was the civilization that moved in and destroyed the habitat. And now that habitat and that soil base can no longer sustain native plants. It's been altered. But there are plants that have learned or you know are adapted to thrive in those particular kinds of disturbances. And we call those invasive species, but they're just thriving in a disturbed, an already disturbed environment. And the disturbance happened from civilization. So invasive species are not to blame for their prolificness in that sense. They're to blame, or they're not, they're not to blame at all. It's that they're thriving in an environment created by civilization. Oftentimes, that's not every single quote unquote invasive species, but the majority that we see live in particular soil bases that are those that have been disturbed. You know, when we think about an intact ecosystem, I have problems with that idea, but an ecosystem that has the capacity to grow particular species, like what we call native plants, that then changes dramatically is not going to be able to grow those same species. The soil oftentimes determines what can grow through the microbiome. And so invasive species have adapted to thrive in the particular microbiome of disturbed soils from civilization. And oftentimes they're doing a service. You know, maybe they're bringing in nitrogen, maybe they're they're fixing the soil, but they're just part of the phases of succession that need to occur there in order to um, restore that soil base to the point where it can grow more and more biodiversity.
So there's a whole thing there in terms of like what species should we reintroduce. On some level, I'm kind of like, fuck it, throw everything at it. <laughs> Elephants, savanna lions, rhinos, like what else, What could we do? What could go wrong? <laughs> um, I don't know. I think at this point, it it's just sort of chaotic. And this comes back to a question that I think about too, where you, Jermaine asks, is it possible that the environment can no longer sustain the indigenous species that once inhabited the area? Absolutely, yes, right? Because the land has been disturbed, the soil has been disturbed, the native plants that were there, the indigenous species, they may not be able to thrive in that disturbed soil because the microbiome of the soil is in some, is, has been altered and now invasive species are the ones that thrive there. So absolutely, it might be possible, and it is happening, that in, you know you oftentimes restoration efforts will replant an area with native plants. Ten years later, all of those are dead and invasive species have moved back in. That's because those invasive species are altering, you know, are thriving in a soil that they're adapted to and the native plants aren't. Things have changed. We can't go back to what, what, what was there. But what we can do is go back to the relationship of regeneration and, repress, and repress, <laughs> reciprocity that existed prior to that um, disturbance. So, uh, yeah, that, that to me is, uh, you know, a large portion, a large idea of rewilding is just planting back and proliferating life in whatever way we can, and things will shake out in the end. But we definitely want to make sure that we're ceasing the level of disturbance that civilization causes and encouraging the regrowth and rewilding of every single environment that we live in. And I'm going to go ahead and stop there for the day. So, yeah, um, that's my, uh, my patron prompts. If you feel like joining my Patreon, that would be very much appreciated, even if it's just at a dollar a month. Um, you know, you'll get the the podcast two weeks early and you can throw me a question through Patreon and I will answer it right here on another podcast. So thank you so much for listening in. And um, yeah, I hope that this spurred even more questions for you. I'm, I'm thinking of even more questions myself now about around all this stuff. Um, but yeah, I just want to also kind of end saying that there's no real certainty in any of my answers. <laughs> I'm somebody who changes their mind a lot and is always looking at different angles of things. So I appreciate people recognizing that, um, you know, I might be wrong in any kind of answer that I had. And I'm aware of that, um, because I don't think that there are any real solid clear cut answers of anything. I think everything is in fluid and flux. And so I appreciate you. Um, appreciating me <laughs> in my uh, humility for not necessarily knowing all the things um, and recognizing that. So again, if there's a question that you have that you have a problem with, or maybe I said something that is like, I don't know about that, I would love to continue um, thinking about these things. So thank you very much for listening, and we will see you next time.